Well, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us um, again today. Um, we appreciate all the feedback we've been getting on our virtual uh, uh, field days and we are still trying to improve them and responding to what you're telling them. Um, the technology side of these things is a work in progress and uh, we keep trying to do what we need to do to make sure that this is a, a worthwhile and educational experience. Um, any te technical difficulties today with the video, I'm gonna take full responsibility. It turns out that my equipment does not appreciate rain and some of the other things that we got thrown at it uh, during the taping of these. So any limitations there is totally on me, but I still hope uh, this is an enjoyable experience for you all. Um, being out in the field and getting this footage rather than using still photographs allows the speaker to cover or address items that they might not have thought about if they weren't out there. And that's one of the reasons what makes this a field day uh, as opposed to a webinar. Um, my name is Jacqueline Camito and I am the uh, director of the Iowa Learning Farms. And uh, uh, the Learning Farms was established in 2004. Uh, we are trying to build a culture of conservation by working with farmers and researchers to implement practices that improve water quality and soil health while remaining profitable. Our partners are the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship, the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, Iowa Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources with the US EPA Section 319, the Conservation Districts of Iowa, Iowa Farm Bureau, Practical Farmers of Iowa, Growmark, uh, Iowa Ag Water Alliance, Iowa Corn, Iowa Nutrient Research Center. And even though that was a long list to say, it's actually really cool that we have all these partners um, that work with us. And of course, we are Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Um, what you're going to get today, um, just a reminder, keep your uh, 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 mute your video and your speaker during the presentations and then we'll open it up. You can either type in your questions via chat and then um, Liz Jukums will read them and help at Adam and, and Kay work their way through it. Or you can actually just speak up and, and ask a question. Um, we will be sending you an evaluation. You'll get one via email on Monday. You know, it's real important to us that we evaluate this type of um, online um, education and field day. So if you could just take the time to um, send this back to us. You know, these field days is just the beginning of the education. Um, and so we really hope that you go out and talk to others about some of the things you're learning. Um, we're real happy with the topic today of wetlands. Um, we hope we, we expose you or, or help raise your awareness of, of some things about wetlands. And this is, um, um, this is just the beginning of a comprehensive wetland outreach that we'll be doing over the next several years. So really happy to welcome Adam Jakey and Kay St uh, Stefanik. Um, and I'm going to uh, let them take over. Okay, well, thanks um, for the introduction. I guess I'll just quickly introduce myself and then Kay can do the same and then we'll get right into the program. My name is Adam Janke. I'm the statewide wildlife extension specialist at Iowa State University. And that means I have responsibilities for wildlife education all around the state. And a lot of my education focuses on finding mutual opportunity areas for wildlife habitat and other conservation practices like soil and water conservation and working landscapes. And you're gonna hear, of course, wetlands are really good for that. And so that's where a lot of my research focuses on wetlands and wetland wildlife, and also a lot of my interest in education. So really appreciate you all joining us today and, and excited about the discussion in the program. Okay. I'm Kay Stefanik, Assistant Director of the Iowa Nutrient Research Center. My background is in uh, wetland and aquatic ecology. So I've done um, a lot of work with um, vegetation as well as nutrient cycling and aquatic ecosystems. Um, so my focus is um, definitely more on the nutrient side of things. Great. So we wanted to provide just a quick introduction to the context for the field day today and sort of where we're gonna go. What the, uh, you know, as Jackie indicated, there's some challenges related to shifting a lot of our education that we like to do out in natural resources where we think natural resource education belongs. Uh, but of course, due to the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to be uh, not in person. So the advantage though, is that it gives us a different opportunity to maybe fly around to places that we couldn't have conceivably visited all during a single field day. And that's definitely the case with wetlands and the diversity of wetlands that we find in Iowa. So 
really, this is kind of a cool opportunity to take advantage of the circumstances and do some uh, learning about wetland diversity by dry, uh, flying around, if you will, uh, landscape in North Central Iowa and exploring six different wetland types. And so that's what we're gonna do today. We wanted to, uh, we're gonna talk about definitions of wetlands and other things, essentially anywhere where water pools on the landscape for um, a period long enough to create soil and vegetation uh, conditions that are favorable to water pooling. Um, and wetlands that we're exploring today are those created by rivers, streams, glaciers, and wildlife, which is in contrast to some of the wetlands that we sometimes explore in water quality education that are just generally created by humans. And so today we're actually focusing primarily on sort of the natural wetlands or the wetlands that exist in Iowa's landscapes historically and still exist today as sort of a feature and, and then um, that's not to discount the importance of constructed wetlands uh, that we do a lot of education uh, regard or in in other arenas. So that's a basic introduction. Kay's going to introduce now just a basic concept of wetland ecosystem goods, goods and services, a term you're going to hear a lot today. And then we're going to jump off from there into the first of our six wetlands that we're going to visit. All right. So for the six different wetlands we're talking about today, we're going to be highlighting a couple of different things. Uh, we're going to talk about their ecosystem services and ecosystem services as well as uh, goods and services are the benefits that wetlands provide to humans. So we're going to try to touch on what makes what ecosystem services you find predominantly in these six different types of wetlands. Uh, we're going to also talk about um, um, the hydrology. Uh, how the water moves through these wetlands and how the hydrology impacts the overall function of the wetlands and what you might see in the wetland. Uh, and we've ordered the six videos uh, based on their hydrology. So we're starting off with a smaller prairie pothole that um, only has water in it for a portion of the year, it tends to have shallow water, and then we're going to work our way up to larger systems that tend to have more permanent water and a little bit deeper water. Okay, perfect. And with that, uh, Liz, you can play the first wetland. So as we explore prairie wetlands or prairie pothole wetlands, what structures the biotic community and also the way that the wetland functions for flood retention or um, water quality or other ecosystem goods and services we expect from wetlands often relates to how permanent the water is. So today as we explore prairie pothole wetlands, we're gonna explore a gradient of water permanencies or what wetland ecologists call hydroperiods. Hydroperiods are essentially when the water occurs in the wetland and for how long. And that's gonna have a big impact on what types of plants and ultimate, ultimately animals live there and also of course how those wetlands function ecologically. The wetland that we're starting on here, uh, many ecologists would call this a seasonal wetland or a wetland with a seasonal hydro period, meaning that it only stays wet for a certain period of time each year uh, and specifically probably historically associated with snow melt. Seasonal wetlands and wetlands with less permanent hydro periods like temporary wetlands would have been the most common wetlands in the Des Moines lobe of Iowa at the time of European settlement. But they've also, because they only have a short hydro period, have been the target of most extensive drainage. Well, these wetlands, these wet spots that are often in crop fields can be real challenges. And so taking them out of crop production and putting them into perennial vegetation, like this small piece we're standing on here today on this farm, can be a good conservation practice to both increase profitability in the rest of the farm on the good, drier, productive acres and uh, improve ecosystem goods and services on this part of the farm where it's wet and the water can pool, allow for denitrification and provide some wildlife habitat. The wildlife that use a seasonal wetland or a wetland with a shorter hydro period are often different than the wildlife that use wetlands with longer hydro periods like semi-permanent wetlands and lakes. Um, these wildlife will generally like to be in dense vegetation uh, and they generally aren't necessarily tied to the occurrence of water because you can't rely on it being there. 
The other thing that wildlife will do on some of these is they'll use them just during the periods when they're wet. And so seasonal and temporary wetlands are really important for migrating shorebirds or migrating waterfowl because right after the snow melt, the water pools here and the birds can use them on their way to Canada or their way uh, to Alaska during their migrations. So as we explore each one of these videos, we're going to take you into the field uh, to explore these wetlands. And again, all these wetlands were shot in, in north central Iowa within an hour and a half or so of Ames. Um, and then we're also, after each video, we're going to share with you a couple of slides that kind of help us expand a little bit on the principles introduced. And then we want to provide an opportunity for some discussion as well as we go. So here's some stuff that we just wanted to share with you to expand uh, on what I talked about in that video and a few things here is one, just where we find wetlands, of course, in our uh, in environment. There, of course, wetlands are coupled between these permanently wet aquatic ecosystems, like we imagine reservoir systems, oceans, permanent lakes, and rivers, and then terrestrial systems, of course, where there's not as much water. And wetlands are the ones in the middle. And the wetlands are defined by the dy dynamic nature of their water levels. And so, that's what the figure on the left is showing. The figure on the left is a little hard to grasp, but it shows a, how water levels, the solid black lines in those figures, vary throughout the year uh, with months from January to, to December on the x-axis down below. And you can see that water levels are naturally dynamic. And how long there's water in the wetland is that concept of a hydro period that we want to, that we'll continue to revisit today and that we sort of structured the lessons on. So Liz, advance to the next slide, please. This, the next slide here is, uh, this is a picture of the wetland that we shot that video on. So this is a crop field. You can see the farm lot there for size and perspective, but this specific wetland, uh, Liz, go ahead, advance to the next one, uh, exists in the wet soils or the hydric soils in this farm field. And you can see here, this is a map of hydric soils in Iowa, produced uh, by uh, agronomists here at Iowa State. And um, you can see that this farmer has obviously made a decision to take that little wet spot in the field out of production uh, and put it into perennial vegetation so they don't have consistent crop failure. So Liz, go ahead and advance the next slide. We can zoom out, this layer is available statewide, and we can zoom out from that field that we were examining, which is in that black box in the upper right. And you can see that these hydric soils exist in our uh, fields uh, at a larger scale here. You can see the neighbors and some neighbors are dealing with the wet spots by putting them in the grass and some of them are continuing to farm them. And then Liz, if you step out another one, this will be Wright County and Franklin County, which was the area we were doing the field day in. Uh, you can see the distribution of those hydric soils across um, the, those two counties. And then finally, Liz, if you take the last one, this shows us the distribution of hydric soils across Iowa's major landforms. And people familiar with our landform regions won't be surprised to hear that the prairie pothole region of the Des Moines lobe in north central Iowa there is the area with the most wetlands. So we wanted to just sort of orient you to that concept of where wetlands are found and where the dynamic hydro periods of wetlands may occur and how soils, uh, in addition to water sources and climate, uh, play a big role in determining those. So we want to pause here and offer an opportunity to answer any questions if any have come in through chat um, or if, if anybody wants to share a question with one of the co-hosts on the chat, uh, we can do that. If, we, um, if you have questions as we go relating to any of the wetlands we've covered or just wetlands generally, please do start to type them into the chat. Uh, and we'll start to address those as we go throughout the, the virtual field day. We want it to be as interactive as possible. So I don't have any questions in my chat. Um, Liz, do you? Uh, Liz says she doesn't. And Kay, do you have any questions yet? Nope. Okay. So why don't folks keep thinking on your questions as these concepts are introduced, anything that's fuzzy. And then we'll let Kay go. And she's going to talk about the next wetland type, which is a fit.
Our next wetland habitat is a fen. Fens are relatively rare in the state of Iowa. Right now we're at a fen on the Des Moines Lobe and you really don't see a lot of this type of habitat here. Fens are mostly found in the northeastern part of the state as well as around Lake Okoboji. Fens are unique in that they receive most of their water from the ground. So they're receiving groundwater. You typically find fens at the bottom of hill slopes. When water, rainwater hits the permeable soil upslope, it infiltrates into the ground, ends up going below the water table, getting into the groundwater, and typically you have an impermeable layer underneath that area. The impermeable layer will kind of direct water through gravity flow down into this fen area. As the water is directed down through here, you can see we don't actually have standing water in this location. So most of the water is in the soil. You see saturated soils within fens. Another unique aspect of fens are that they're peat accumulating. When you think of peat accumulating wetlands, most people think of bogs. In Iowa, we have fens. The difference between the two is bogs are acidic, fens are not. Fens tend to be approximately neutral pH, and in some instances you can even get alkaline. Because of the groundwater moving through the soil, it's typically either picking up nutrients from the mineral soil, or it can also pick up nutrients from surrounding agricultural usage. So you get a little bit of nutrient reduction in fens, but typically not a lot. Fens contain a number of unique species. There are a lot of rare and threatened plant species that can be found in fens. Due to the unique type of habitat, as well as the almost constant input of groundwater to the system, these really don't work well for agriculture. It's best to avoid any type of farming in these areas. The groundwater infiltration will cause them to be wet pretty much year round. All right, so the first slide here is uh, kind of re-emphasizing the flow of water through the system and where water and fens come from. So on the left-hand side of this figure, you have your hill slope, the rain hits the surface, infiltrates into the ground, ends up in groundwater, and flows by uh, gravity flow towards that, that fen, that area that's labeled peat on the figure. You can see there's that impermeable layer, something that water can't get through, that's helping to direct the flow of water towards a fen. Uh, fens are also peat accumulating. In bogs, it's usually peat accumulating because it's acidic. In fens, you have that peat accumulation or that dead plant material accumulating because of low oxygen concentrations in the groundwater. The microorganisms that would typically decay the plants aren't there. Um, they can't survive without that oxygen, so they're not there breaking down the plants and you get the peat, peat accumulation. Um, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, so this is a map of fens throughout Iowa. Uh, the fen, the dot that has the red circle around it is the fen that we are at. And you can see that a lot of these fens are either on the northeastern part of the state or in the Lake Okoboji area. So we'll again offer an opportunity if folks have questions, type them in the chat uh, or keep thinking on them as we go. Um, I don't have any in mind. I've got them coming in here. Okay, perfect. So Liz. First one up. So what are the species that are unique to fens? So you have um, a number of different types of plants. Um, I have to admit, I am know more about fens on towards the east coast so i'm still learning what plant species are actually here um, i know in other parts of the country i'm not sure if you find them in iowa but that's where you tend to see like the carnivorous plants uh, so things like pitcher plants venus fly traps um, things that are, are capturing insects and breaking them down for nutrients um, i got another one in here where can we find the hydric soils map layers for Iowa? So that 
slide that I was sharing was a GIS shapefile that Brad Miller, who's an agronomist faculty member in the Department of Agronomy here at Iowa State, uh, put out associated with that paper. So I am not sure of a, like if, if, the, if the person that is asking the question has access to ArcGIS, it's easy to access and it's through uh, Dr. Miller's site, website. Um, if the person doesn't have access to ArcGIS, then it may be hard to show that. But by going to the web soil survey on the um, U.S. Department of Ag website, which is just, if you just Google web soil survey, you'll find, quickly find your way to the website. You could uh, create an area of interest on your farm and then identify the different soil types and then go into the attributes of those soils and find their classification for hydric or um, the tendency for water to pool on them. But the layers that I showed are uh, an original shape file that are used in GIS. I have a quick question, Kay. Um, so it looked like when you showed the map, the Des Moines lobe really doesn't have that many fens, right? So it's mostly yes. to one side or the other. What, what do you think explains that in terms of, because I know they're, they're, you know, what you talked about, alkaline or the uh, acidic. What do you think explains that? So I think um, one reason might have to do with the topography within the Des Moines lobe. The Des Moines lobe was, I believe, the last glaciated area in Iowa. So it's um, flatter than some other areas. Uh, a lot of times you see fens on those hill slopes. Um, and as for the, the pH, um, with bogs being kind of acidic, fens being neutral, that has to do with where the water is coming from. Fens have that groundwater influence. So they're pulling in minerals from the ground whereas bogs are mainly precipitation fed. Precipitation is acidic, um, so it means it might be around like pH of five or six, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, so the bogs that are primarily rain fed are getting that acidic water, and that's one thing that helps make them acidic. All right, so keep getting those questions typed in there or asked, and we'll move on to the next video and take another short break for questions following the play of that video. Okay, now we're on a semi-permanent wetland, and this is just a, the one in the middle of our prairie wetlands that we're gonna explore. And remember, we talked about hydro periods at the seasonal wetland, and here, a semi-permanent wetland, that stands or represents the semi-permanent nature of the water on this wetland. This type of a wetland with interspersion of open water and emergent vegetation like cattails and bulrushes is probably the classic wetland that people think of when you just say the word wetland. The interspersion of open water and emergent vegetation on a wetland like this is uh, really important for its productivity, for both uh, its function in terms of water quality and also its function in terms of having wildlife diversity. On this wetland here that we're on today, there's a pair of breeding trumpeter swans. You can hear all of the blackbirds, red-winged blackbirds calling behind me. Uh, we know that there's a suite of birds called secretive marsh birds like Virginia rails and soras that breed on this wetland uh, and others. That's because that interspersion of open water and emergent vegetation and also submersed vegetation in the water itself creates a lot of different habitat in this type of a wetland. All of that emergent vegetation and water also is where denitrification is occurring. And that's where these wetlands provide some really important ecosystem services because the shallow shape of the wetland combined with the abundant carbon, so carbon sources in the emergent vegetation create lots of surface areas for denitrification. And these wetlands can be really effective in removing nitrates from surface water. These wetlands, like other uh, prairie pothole wetlands that are depressions and relatively high spots in the landscape, are fed by surface water, rain, and shallow subsurface flow. Some semi-permanent wetlands can be restored and drain tile can be routed into them in some cases. This wetland here was actually restored through a program associated with the farm bill on this private farmland. 
Semi-permanent wetlands today are one of our most abundant wetland classes of the remaining wetlands we have because they've been the focus of a lot of restoration efforts, uh, particularly across north central Iowa on the Des Moines lobe where we find these prairie pothole wetlands. But you can find wetlands that look a lot like this with an interspersion of emergent vegetation and open water in other ecosystems, like for example associated with rivers like the Sweet Marsh in northeastern Iowa or other riverine wetland systems like those found uh, along the Nishnabotna and other tributaries in the Missouri River in southwestern Iowa. Sometimes semi-permanent wetlands can be restored in farm fields in areas where there's just persistent flooding issues and that was the case on this farm. So sometimes it's just best to farm around these wetlands or find opportunity areas on your farm where it may be flood prone and it may be an opportunity to restore a wetland through for example a farm program and uh, have all the wildlife, water quality and other benefits associated with them uh, and take that non-profitable piece of the farm out of production. Okay, so we have a couple of slides here to share with you to expand on these points and also to brag a little bit about the history of wetland research in Iowa. Um, I did my training on wetlands um, first in the field by tromping around in wetlands in Indiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin, and then uh, I did my PhD studying wetlands in South Dakota. And in all those places, we heard about these pioneering concepts, one of which is the idea of cycling of wetland vegetation and how that cycling associated with those concepts of hydro period create the diversity and productivity that wetlands are known for. And that idea was pioneered right here in Iowa and published in this paper um, in the journal Ecology. And so what this picture depicts is the natural cycle of wetland vegetation that goes from dry marsh, you know, where sediments get oxidized and vegetation starts to grow and germinate, to a regenerating marsh where vegetation starts to grow and is healthy and sort of has uh, vigor to a degenerating marsh as water levels start to stabilize and the diversity of plants tends to decline as it gets further away from those highly productive oxidized sediments that came from the drought period into a lake marsh where almost nothing, uh, no emergent vegetation is there, very little, and then eventually back to a drought. And so again, this is a very important concept in understanding why and how wetlands are productive and those productivity factors can relate to things like water quality and also to uh, wildlife habitat. On the next slide here, we will, uh, sh I'll share with you another really important concept, especially in the wildlife world. And this is the idea of how important it is for wetlands to have interspersion of emergent vegetation. This is a concept I mentioned in the video, but we talk about in wildlife education called the Hemi Marsh. And you can see here the black depicts areas of open water and you can see how it changed on this wetland and these researchers here at Iowa State back in the 1960s documented that the most bird diversity and wildlife diversity was found right in that middle sort of the Goldilocks principle of wetland management where the most wildlife diversity is found right uh, in the middle of a dry and a completely open wetland environment. So I wanted to share with you those two studies that sort of reinforce the importance of diverse emergent plants in uh, wetlands. And I, have, I don't have any questions, Liz. Did you have any more questions come in during that one? Oops, sorry about that, I'm still muted. I have not had any come in. So if anyone wants to ask their question now, feel free to save yourself the typing and just unmute to ask your question. Yeah, Adam, I'm actually going to throw a question in here. What kind of programs? So this one was one that was reconstructed, right? Yep. Actually, both that we showed were. So what other programs? I know we saw Ducks Unlimited fund some of these. Who else funds them? Yeah, so in, we want to, um, we were going to come back to that at the end and talk about almost everything we're talking about today has a program available, particularly for a private landowner. And lots of people are involved in these restoration efforts. Um, in the cases of privately owned wetlands that we've been visiting, they're mostly restored through um, uh, programs related to the Farm Bill, either through FSA and programs related to the Conservation Reserve Program or a wetland easement program. Uh, also through NRCS, through programs like the Environmental Qualities Incentives Program. Um, and then also there's state level support for lots of wetland restorations and projects. 
I was yesterday and the day before starting to try to develop a comprehensive list and then quickly realized that that was not, or that exercise was futile. And so we wanted to just mainly just suggest that you go to a local NRCS or uh, soil and water conservation district to get answers to what programs are available for wetland restoration, because it may be locally funded initiatives, or uh, in some cases, we even see some private investment. Like for example, Pheasants Forever has a program right now targeting seasonal wetlands, wet spots and crop fields, uh, completely separate from government programs. So lots of options out there for people to make this work on their farm. I have had one come in. So is pushing modification of existing wetlands to allow for drawdowns where able a valuable addition to eco services? Yeah, that's one of the challenges in wetland management in today's environment is that the wetlands can be um, sometimes held at a constant water level and eventually their productivity declines. And so um, artificially manipulating water levels to simulate historic droughts is a really good way to increase the productivity of a wetland. You trade off, of course, in one year, you lose a little bit of wetland productivity, but the gain in plants and animals in subsequent years can make up for that loss. And so, yeah, many wetlands today are designed to have water control structures and people uh, take care to try to introduce disturbances like drought, fire, or grazing that can increase plant diversity and thus the function of the wetland. Okay, why don't we jump to the next one? I did have one question come in, but we'll have Kay answer it after the uh, next one that we talk about. So the next one we're going to talk about is an oxbow wetland. Now we are at an oxbow wetland. Oxbows form when meanders in a river get cut off from the main channel over time. This can happen either naturally or it can happen through channelization. Oxbows can be found in riverine settings throughout the state of Iowa. Uh, they are really great habitat for things like migratory birds, fish, um, uh, reptiles, and they're also good breeding habitat for a number of uh, different types of fish, including the endangered uh, Topeka shiner. In addition to the Topeka shiner, you also see other shiners, darters, and dace using these areas. Because of the riverine setting, oxbows are good at holding stormwater, flood water. When a river floods over its banks, that water can end up in an oxbow, where it's held on the landscape for usually an extended period of time, instead of that water rushing directly downstream. That water can then either slowly be released back into the river, or it can end up in the groundwater. The oxbow that you see behind me is currently at capacity. Uh, we've had a number of large storm events over the past couple days that have led to this wetland filling up. So right now it's acting to hold storm water and a little further down there's actually an outlet to the stream where this water is slowly moving back into the stream channel. The oxbow behind me is a restored oxbow. It is a multi-purpose oxbow. It is designed to help treat tile line water coming from an agricultural setting. Multipurpose oxbows were approved by the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy Science Team as an acceptable method for reducing nitrate from tile line water. Uh, nitrate is removed through the process of denitrification. There are microorganisms in the soil that take up nitrate and release nitrogen gas to the atmosphere. In this particular agricultural setting, there is also a bioreactor and a saturated buffer that are in use to reduce nitrate levels coming off of the field, uh, in addition to the oxbow here. One of the added benefits of the oxbow compared to the saturated buffer and the bioreactor is that you also get aquatic habitat. There's a space for birds, fish, other organisms to use this, um, whereas you don't have that same type of benefit, especially not with the bioreactor. This particular oxbow differs from a natural oxbow uh, in that there are no trees here. The natural wetland that we were able to get footage from had a number of different tree species in the area, um, typical of riparian oxbows in the state. So this first figure illustrates how an oxbow is formed. Um, you start with a stream that has kind of a meander in it. Over time, that channel shifts. Um, 
in the landscape and eventually you get that meander being cut off from the main channel. And that meander ends up being an oxbow which functions as a wetland instead of as stream habitat. And this is under natural conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Now the agricultural oxbow I was at was restored and the um, time lapse kind of photos that you see on the screen now are changes in the channel as well as the oxbow over time. So originally that oxbow was part of the channel, but in about, I'm gonna say 60s to 70s uh, area, the stream channel, it was channelized um, by humans and that part of the meander got cut off from the stream channel. Um, I want to also point out that this oxbow was restored I want to say 2017-ish, um, and when you're doing any sort of wetland restoration or wetland creation, you're going to have a lot of soil disturbance, and this soil disturbance is perfect habitat for weedy species and invasive species to come in. Uh, and if, if you know um, kind of plant identification, you might have noticed at the Oxbow, I was standing in a field of reed canary grass. I was standing in a field of invasive species. So it's really important that whenever you're disturbing soil in a wetland, either through creation, restoration, um, that you make sure you put some sort of plant in the landscape to try to fill those uh, different types of habitats and making sure that you're managing the vegetation over the first couple five years or so to make sure you don't end up with just one large stand of an invasive species. And I actually had two questions about fens. Um, are there any questions about the oxbows or should I just jump into the fen questions? So Kate, this is Jackie. Um, as we're turning toward more of these reconstructed oxbows uh, across Iowa, hopefully we'll get lots of these, right? Because they're going to play a part mm -hmm. in water quality. How do you suggest they, like who should they be working with to make sure they're getting good plant uh, plantings and and so that we're not getting those invasive species? I, I'd say go with, um, check with your, your county offices, um, and then also feel free to reach out to people in extension. Um, if you have multiple kind of opinions and you get a lot of overlapping opinions on how it should be constructed, how, uh, or what types of plants should go in, you're likely, um, those overlapping kind of opinions are likely good, and I would probably go with those. Um, I know there are, depending on how you restore, um, like if you wanted to uh, seed an area, I know that there are companies that um, you can buy seed for, I, I think it's labeled as kind of a wet prairie mix for these areas. I would just recommend going with um, a seed mix that is kind of local from the state of Iowa, from the region, I wouldn't get seed mixes from other areas. So it's, it would seem to me that this is going to be similar to maybe what happened with the crep wetlands in terms of trying to make sure that we had some good seeding out there and maybe there's some lessons learned from crep. I don't know. No. I, it's a work in progress. Um, it's, there's a learning curve whenever you create wetlands. Uh, so because oxbows are new, it's going to take time to figure out what works really well in, in Iowa. And a lot of wetland plants will colonize as well, like birds, birds transplant wetland plants very, very effectively and floods move wetland plants. As Kay mentioned, though, the challenge is whenever you have that bare ground phenomenon, that's the opportunity that uh, maybe some invasive plants, especially associated with rivers and streams, can take, take, a, take hold. So, yeah, I think there's going to be some learning to do as we restore. And just to clarify, restoring oxbow wetlands is actually um, generally just excavating sediment out of them. Uh, and so minimizing disturbance during that excavation can help as well. I think I might hold the two fun questions till the end, but I, I will get to them. Okay, okay. Right. we'll go back to uh, our third and final prairie wetland. So we're here on our last type of prairie pothole wetland, and this is the one that probably to most viewers or most 
um, observers looks the least like a wetland. But uh, ecologists and wildlife biologists and even aquatic scientists that manage fisheries uh, recognize these types of ecosystems as wetlands because they follow the same characteristics that we've talked about with all of our other wetlands. They have dynamic water levels, they have um, a diversity of water adapted and water loving plants, and they have, uh, of course, a source of water coming from uh, the landscape or from surface flow. The lake that we're visiting today is called Elm Lake, and Elm Lake is one of many glacial lakes found in north central Iowa. Uh, these lakes were created the same way all other prairie pothole wetlands were created by the nature of the retreat of the Wisconsin Glacier. It created a series of upland depressions uh, that were isolated from stream connections. And in this case, it just happens to be rather large and relatively deep. Uh, and it also has soils that favor more permanence of the water. So this lake, according to the Iowa Department of Natural Resources that has uh, maps available for all these uh, large uh, lakes in north central Iowa, the maximum depth of this entire lake behind me is actually only eight feet. And the average depth of the lake behind me is four and a half feet. And so although they look big and like you, and you would think maybe that they were deep uh, water bodies, really they are relatively flat, um, shallow water bodies, much like other prairie pothole wetlands we've been looking at today. There were historically more large lakes like this in Iowa, but many of them were converted uh, at the same time that many of the other types of wetlands we're talking about today were converted from wetlands into agricultural production. So those remaining wetlands uh, that are in this larger, more permanent class of, of glacial lakes uh, today still have some unique management challenges related to what's going on in the surrounding watershed. Uh, one thing is that inputs of drainage water can actually make these lakes more permanent and less inclined for drought or uh, entire dryouts than they would have been prior to European settlement. Because of all the input of extra water from the watershed uh, and also often artificial controls on the wetlands create more static water levels. More static water levels create challenges for managing these as wetland ecosystems uh, than would have occurred historically. Uh, namely related to the management of fish populations. So the management of the biotic communities in these wetlands is where there's the most opportunities for their improvement. And one of the biggest challenges in a glacial lake like this is the colonization and abundance of r what we call rough fish, primarily uh, exotic species of carp. And these exotic species of carp feed on the bottom of the wetlands and they actually pump nutrients that would have otherwise just been settled on the lake floor. They pump them up into the water column and completely change the biotic community of the lake. There's actually really interesting research about alternate stable states between lakes colonized by high densities of benthivorous fish like carp and lakes uh, colonized and, and maintained in a community that favors fish eating fish like yellow perch and walleye and northern pike. And so lots of the management in these lake ecosystems focuses on trying to convert back to that system that has more abundant plants, uh, both submerged plants and emergent plants, clearer water and a dominance of fish eating fish. So the, um, again, I kind of, I, I expect uh, as a wildlife ecologist, an occasional eye roll when I go to a lake shore and talk about it as a wetland. But hear me out, I'm trying to make my point that these uh, ecosystems, particularly glacial lakes found in Iowa and across the upper Midwest, like Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, and the Dakotas, that were created and associated with the retreat of the Wisconsin Glacier function much more like a wetland ecosystem than a, what we may think of as a lake. So these glacial lakes, we find these all over the Des Moines lobe and the only other place in Iowa where we find natural lakes are associated with rivers like big oxbows. And so I think it's called Blue Lake in southwestern Iowa uh, associated with the Missouri River. I think I got that name right. Uh, is a big lake associated with an oxbow. All the other lakes are reservoirs. So what we're talking about here doesn't apply to a reservoir system, but it does apply to glacial lakes that go through periods of drought associated with climate changes and uh, their hydro period. And so 
for proof of this point, here's the lake that we visited, Elm Lake in Wright County. I mentioned it's eight feet, four and a half feet average depth according to this map from the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And here's the aerial photographs of this, of this lake or this wetland uh, in the 1930s, the 1950s, 1970s, and 1990s. And you can see that same pattern that we're talking about with wetlands where we go through these periods of wet and dry and that's driving the distribution and diversity of vegetation on these lakes. And so you can see in 1950, this wetland was almost completely dry. Um, and then uh, today, of course, it's quite full. Uh, those periods of drought help us control the plant species and the animal species and can create alternative conditions for these wetlands uh, in, in their function. So if you advance to the next slide, Liz, this is a figure, a little bit of a technical figure, but um, there's a really rich body of research that's come out of these northern glacial lakes about what we scientists call alternate stable states. And you can see that pictured perfectly from this picture from Minnesota. The blue one is in a plant dominated state. The green one, the lower wetland, is in a chlorophyll dominated state or uh, where um, there's a abundance of um, plankton in the water column created by benthivorous fish cranking nutrients up out of the sediment and into the water where the plankton can take advantage of them and then change the turbidity of the water and it shifts it from a plant dominated um, system where there's fish eating fish and cleaner water to a nutrient enriched system that has a lot of um, uh, chlorophyll or um, uh, phytoplankton in the water column. So that's, that's the subject of an entire webinar. It's the subject of an entire textbook, actually. I won't bore you with the details, but we wanted to sort of put on your radar that lakes are, glacial lakes uh, are in fact uh, wetlands as well, many of Iowa's natural lakes. I did get a question to come in. Great. Is curly leaf pondweed a problem species for wetlands as it is in lakes, or are yeah. other invasive species more commonly a problem? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And so, uh, one, if you adopt the wildlife biologist definition of uh, a lake, you will find that the places where we have big issues and concerns about curly leaf pondweed and exotic invasive plant species are glacial lakes like Okaboji and, and Spirit Lake and Storm Lake and those found at Familiar Lakes in North Central Iowa. So yes, curly leaf pondweed and a bunch of other invasive species like zebra mussels and um, and then of course common carp are real problems in glacial lakes. There's also problems with invasive species in, in wetlands. Uh, Kay already mentioned reed canary grass changes the dynamics or the vegetation diversity of the shallowest parts or the most ephemeral parts of a wetland and that's led to the loss of some really neat in, uh, plant communities in those areas of wetlands. And then um, we have other invasive species like what we call hybrid cattail, which is a mixture of our native cattail and an exotic species of cattail that's really vigorous in its growth and can take over uh, wetlands. Um, we have a few issues with Phragmites and, um, and then exotic species of fish, um, even native species of fish like fathead minnows, if they're introduced, like for example, for rearing for bait fisheries, uh, they can be a real problem in wetlands as well. Any other questions or should we jump to the last one? Let's jump to the last one then. We've got one more wetland uh, and that's, Kay's gonna present about beaver wetlands. So now we are at a beaver pond wetland. Behind me, you can see the beaver dam. The way this wetland was formed was through animal activity. So beavers, sometimes known as ecosystem engineers, created a dam to stop the flow of water to a larger stream. By stopping the flow of water, creating ponded wetland habitat behind it. So they're referred to as ecosystem engineers because they create such large changes to an ecosystem. They're basically converting a stream or a channel to a larger wetland habitat. With the ponding of water, you can see that the water behind the dam is moving relatively slow. So you have slow flow of water that allows 
soil sediment particles to settle out of the water column. So if you think of all of the agriculture upstream that might be losing some soil, as that water flows through this ponded wetland, that sediment, that soil particles will settle out. And in the process of settling out, you also get phosphorus. It's bound to those soil particles settling out of the water column as well, resulting in some phosphorus reduction. Uh, beaver uh, wetlands are also good for reducing nitrogen. So now we've moved to the upper portion of the beaver pond. You can see there is vegetative habitat behind me. You have emergent plants. When beavers create uh, a dammed area, they alter the types of plants that you see in the area. This was once likely a riparian, either forest or vegetated area with more upland plants. Now you can see we have flooded conditions, emergent vegetation behind me. Uh, typically you also see a switch from tree species to emergent vegetation in beaver ponds. As the beavers take down trees to build their dam, as well as as the water level rises, it can kill off some of the trees that were once in this area. In agricultural settings, the placement of beaver dams can sometimes be problematic if they're in an area where they might cause uh, large-scale flooding of cropland or other important agricultural areas. Uh, sometimes they are formed in areas where maybe they don't cause a lot of damage to crops or other um, uh, structures. In the case where they're in areas where they're not doing a lot of damage, this can kind of be seen as free wetland restoration. You have beavers coming in, doing all the work to create the ponded area. Uh, once they create the proper hydrologic conditions, the plants, the animals, the other organisms are going to come in naturally. In an agricultural setting where you have wetland habitat, agricultural maybe drainage water coming into the wetland, you have good potential for phosphorus and nitrogen reduction. I just wanted to quickly put up a photo of a beaver. I'm sure most of you know what one looks like, just in case. Um, this is the ecosystem engineer that created um, um, that habitat. Uh, next slide, please. Now, just a quick image on how uh, these wetlands are formed. You typically have a stream or channel, as you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Beavers will come in. They use um, sticks, mud. Uh, to block the flow of water. Uh, because they block the, the water from moving downstream, that water is going to uh, flood the surrounding riparian area. And once that area is uh, flooded, you start getting um, herbaceous vegetation, emergent wetland plants coming in, colonizing the area, and eventually uh, animals coming into the area as well. Now, are there um, any questions on the, the beaver pond? So I'm guessing most people, most farmers might see this as a nuisance, maybe the beaver ponds, mm -hmm. as a as a not desirable. And how many are there of these, you know, across the Des Moines Lobe or, you know, we got a lot of rivers. So yes, they can definitely be seen as a nuisance, especially if there's concern that they're going to block a tile line and cause flooding in the field. Uh, so I definitely say that you don't want a beaver creating a dam just anywhere. They, are, they can be problematic. They need to be managed in certain cases, but if it's uh, creating a dam in an area that wasn't profitable to begin with, maybe is a little on the wetter side, um, that could potentially be an area where you might be willing to let the, the beaver create the dam and create the wetland habitat. And then, sorry, what was the second part of the question? I don't know. I forgot. I, I was enjoying listening many, to your answers so well. There was, how many? How many oh, there? how many do we have these? How many do you estimate? Uh, uh, you know, because we have a lot of rivers in the state, so I'm guessing. And I've seen a lot of beaver activity lately at lakes and at other places where I've been walking. So, I I am not sure. Do you know, Adam? No, I could take a stab at. It. I mean, the short answer is we have no idea. But we like. You know, beavers do two things that you'll see them active along rivers and there they're actually often not damming things they're living like in the banks and so there's places where you'll see beaver damage and they're not necessarily creating a wetland like Kate talked about how many of these wetlands 
I don't know. We know beavers are in every county in Iowa, which is pretty remarkable because in the early 1900s, they were in zero counties in Iowa. They uh, naturally colonized back into portions of the state, and then the Iowa DNR also assisted their distribution back across the state as well. Um, I think you could find beaver dams, definitely, or beaver wetlands, uh, for sure in every county in the state. And in some counties where the topographic conditions are favorable, you'll find a lot of beaver activity. So I don't know if there's a solid answer, but as Kay said in the video, I love the line as something like, they're like free wetland restorers if they happen to pick a spot on the landscape that people are okay with a wetland being restored there. Um, and, you know, yeah, conflicts um, come when, when they're not okay with that. Well, you know, the one thing you, you all haven't really talked about that much, but when you're watching the videos, it's really clear. And since I was out with you in the videos and out at that beaver pond where it was really rainy, like Kate's got, Kate's got water dripping off of her in that video, but it was beautiful. It was just beautiful to be at. That particular one was probably my favorite out of all six that we visited. It was so, it, you know, it was mysterious to be there. It was, you know, just beautiful. And there was a lot of wildlife there. And the cool thing about that wetland that we were visiting, that was on privately owned land. And the area where the beavers were was in a wetland reserve program easement. Um, but the beavers had created quite a wetland out there, a wetland that wasn't there before the beavers moved in and had really enhanced it. So um, you're right, it's pretty remarkable. It's one of the two wetlands we featured that had breeding trumpeter swans. And um, we saw black terns on that wetland. We, there's all sorts of cool stuff going on uh, on a wetland like that. I've got a couple beaver questions that came in. Great. So both beaver dam wetlands and man-made impoundments often flood stands of trees. Does the de decay and death of those trees cause long-lasting negative impacts to the wetland or the lake water quality? I'd say they're positive. Uh, they provide a lot of valuable habitat for um, roosting birds. Uh, also, as those uh, trees fall into the water, the trunks can be habitat for the smaller aquatic organisms for invertebrates that you'd find in wetlands. They're also um, releasing, they do release some nutrients, which isn't always a bad thing. Uh, it can be beneficial for plants and other things uh, growing right around the tree. So I'd say it's great having those there. All right, next up, how can we encourage more beavers? What can we do? I I, I could try that one, Kay. I mean, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, it would be creating conditions where, you know, beavers would be able to thrive. So like relatively low gradient streams or streams that they'd be able to colonize where they have a food source. Um, and so one way to do this would be like really flood prone areas adjacent to rivers and streams that we maybe try to farm and are only successful in pulling a crop off of them every couple of years. Uh, taking those out of crop production and putting them into some sort of perennial vegetation that'll eventually be able to transition into trees would be a good way to kind of set the stage for a beaver to find their way into a landscape. And then the other thing is like tolerance for beavers in landscapes where they are dispersing. You know, Kay mentioned the conflicts and of course that's true. Um, and you know, beavers I do know will use corn where trees don't uh, exist and that's a problem. And so finding ways to sort of uh, extend our tolerance of beavers and keeping them in our landscapes could be a way to get some more free wetland construction uh, back out there. Mm -hmm. and there's actually a really cool uh, PBS special that aired a number of years ago focused on uh, beavers, uh, beavers being reintroduced into an area. And one technique that they use to get beavers to um, to kind of build in the desirable area was to put out uh, a sound system and play running louder so that it was louder in that area than other areas and they like the sound of running water and they like blocking that off so I, I just thought that was kind of interesting I don't know if it would work here but maybe. All right final question what are the barriers to wetland restoration in Iowa? Um. I can take a first stab and then Kay, you want to go after that? Does that work? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that there may be a lot of barriers. We could, um, you know, finding suitable places to put them. There's no shortage of suitable places because as we talked about, these hydric soils are really widespread. But in terms of meeting, you know, landowner desires with land, that could be a barrier. One thing we have to talk about a lot with like issues of 
like beavers are a perfect example of them is like what's good for the stream and what's good for downstream water quality and what's good for wildlife etc is often incongruent with landowner objectives so a beaver wetland uh, in most places is wonderful. It's going to reduce nitrogen, it's going to provide wildlife habitat, sequester floodwaters, do all these really cool things we just talked about. But if it's on your 80 acres and you had other plans for those 80 acres, then it's a problem. And so that's a barrier is just finding where we have the opportunity meets the interest in terms of landowner goals. Um, for some wetlands, restoration requires a lot of work. And the work uh, has barriers in two ways. One would be financial barriers, just for example, if you needed to excavate a bunch of, you know, 100 years worth of sediment out of an oxbow, uh, that's going to take a lot of dump trucks and equipment and everything else, and that costs money. And then uh, finally, technical skills. You know, wetland restoration can be challenging, especially when it's in an area where you risk putting water back onto a neighbor. All of our drainage laws are structured to get water off and not really uh, very forgiving when we put water back on. Uh, and so the conflicts with neighbors and things require some pretty precise engineering. And we just need technical service and the money to pay those technical service providers out on our landscape. So that would be sort of my outline of the challenges on this. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. I think it's um, space, um, resources, money to do it. All right, so okay, I know you had a couple more questions maybe about FENS, and as you do that, I'm going to share my screen one last time for those interested in CCA credits. Uh, we have those available for, for today's field day. Um, you can email me, there's my email there, by 5 p.m. today with your name, the name you used to watch the webinar, and your CCA number. And you can plan to join us again in two weeks on June 11th at 1 o'clock. We're going to be exploring the Bear Creek Saturated Buffer. Uh, it's the first one ever created, so wanted to get that in there and then Kay if you want to answer those fen questions. Sure um, so one was what is the difference between a seep versus fen uh, and I've heard the word seep used for a couple of different types of situations. Um, when I think of a seep I usually think of a very localized area where water is coming out sometimes you can actually see the water like seeping out of like um, a hill slope um, whereas with a fen it's not just one like point location where you get that seep occurring or one very small area where the seep is occurring. With the fen, um, if you saw the hill slope in the video, you may have had, um, it's likely that groundwater is coming into that fen all along that entire length of the hill slope. So I'd say that's probably one of the biggest issues. Seeps tend to be much more localized uh, because they're more localized. And um, I also, I've seen them more in kind of rocky type situations you may not have the substrate available for, or even the space available for a full fen to form. And then the last fen question. Um, since fen wetlands do not lend themselves well to being cropped, are most of the fen wetlands untouched or undrained? I'd say it depends on what part of the state you're in. Um, there have been a lot of areas where people have tried to farm on fens. Uh, these are typically going to be the areas where the farmer is just constantly fighting in that one area to get uh, good productivity. It's always going to be wet. This is one area where if you do try to farm it, I don't think you'll be able to win against nature, not, not against a fen. Okay, I think that's it for questions, right? Kay, Adam? Uh, yep. All right. So, hey, thank you everyone for joining us. Again, check us out in a couple weeks when we do a virtual tour of Bear Creek, and that should be really good. Um, Kay, Adam, thank you so much for your time today. I know I was engrossed in the whole conversation, so hope everybody learned something. And uh, again, fill out our evaluation, give us feedback. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks.